So again, thank you for joining us for today's program, which is Organizing Critical Information and Documents with Susan Pollack. Um, if you are watching this presentation via recording, you can download a copy of the outline we will be referring to by scanning this QR code, or alternatively, you can go directly to this link right below, the bit.ly link, uh, in order to access the outline. Now I'm going to hand it off to Susan. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Um, I, I have, as it says, done this program a few times, but I thought it would be helpful if I could explain how it came into existence. Um, my husband died a few years ago, and after some thinking and getting I was in New York at the time. I came out to see my family here, and I realized I had to redo all my will and trust and all that stuff when I decided to be a California resident, which I did, which is why I'm here. And as part of that, because I have, uh, I had new executors and stuff like that, I decided I needed to bring together all the information that an executor or a caretaker or somebody would need. Um, so I created an outline of over time, oh, you know, it took a week and I kept writing notes to myself. And um, I was, uh, I did the outline and then I put the, I did it on my computer. I put the outline aside and I filled another copy of it in for my kids who were the ones who were going to get it all. And then I would be having lunch or whatever with friends and they'd say, oh, can we have a copy of your outline? I need to do that. And um, after a while uh, of one at a time having these lunches, a friend of mine said, why don't you go talk to the people at SF Village because they have programs like that way, like that kind of a program. And I did. And I have since done a few of this program, which is to go over my outline, and it's my outline, I keep saying this, everybody has to make sure the outline's right for them. Um, and I've now done it, I did it at one of the public libraries, and then I got in touch with Jonathan, who said, why don't we try it on Zoom? So that's what we're doing today. And I will say, as I have said before, this is my outline. It started as my outline, but every time I do a program, Somebody suggests something. I mean, the first time a man who was listening said, you haven't mentioned information about safe deposit box. Does that mean that we shouldn't have a safe deposit box? And I said, no, what it means is that I don't have a safe deposit box. But there's no reason, you know, if you have a safe deposit box, add it. And my outline now has safe deposit box on it because... And, and so as I go through the conversations in these meetings, and I like to think of them as conversations, um, inevitably I get something else and I go back to my outline and I add it. So you can tell if you've looked at the outline and the last time I did the program was in February and I learned something in February and I added it to the outline. So I'm hoping that as we go along, there will be some dialogue because I suspect a lot of you have this in mind. And I did look one chat, which was how do I find a waterproof container for my documents? And the truth of the matter is when one of the groups came back together and everybody showed what he or she had done. And one woman said, I'm worried about the fire watering sprinkling system in my apartment going off. So I have a waterproof sort of folder envelope and I keep it in the refrigerator so that if there's a really lot of rain, it will stay dry. And so I thought, wow, I didn't put that in the outline, but it's the kind of ideas that people come up with. So what I would like to do just for starters is start going through the outline with you. And my purpose is to go through what's in the outline and my thinking of why I put things in, which is appropriate to me. And the, the first example of that is the order in which things appear in the outline. And you will see 
that in my case, there, there are about, I don't know, five or six different sections in which I list items. Because my mother had dementia, the, what I listed first was all the personal information that if my kids have to take care of me when I'm no longer able to, they'll know who all the people are and other things like that. So, Jonathan, can we just put the outline up for... Um, how many of you, I can't see hands, but how many of you had a chance to print the outline? Anybody want to raise his or her hand? I can see if anybody says yes. Well, let's assume that for starters, um, a lot of you do not have it printed, but I know it was sent to you all. So if you think it would be useful, you can print it later. So I start out with um, the contacts that I think people would need, either my executor or uh, somebody helping me. So I have who's the I have the estate attorney. Um, I could also have, but I don't have one, a licensed fiduciary if a licensed fiduciary were acting in some capacity for me. I have my the man who helps me uh, with financial matters. The the I have. I indicate which are my banks. This is on, not on my public outline, but on the copy that I have given. Um, but I didn't, please note, put my bank account numbers, even in what I created for my executor. I told my executor where to find my bank account statements. And Jonathan and I were talking. In my case, I still want paper statements. So I could say, go into the room with the washer and dryer and there's a file box and in it are the bank statements. So if someone needs my bank account. I don't like it on computer documents. I don't like having bank account numbers, but I like to tell people where they can find stuff like that. Who's my insurance agent? I mean, I have uh, insurance policies. Who's I have an accountant. I have a long list of doctors. It's, people my age do these days. Uh, I've listed them all, which is my pharmacy, you know, all these kinds of things that someone, if they're helping you, uh, some of these would be useful to an executor, some of them only while you're still alive, but whatever are the people that other people should know. I mean, it, the list is not exhaustive. It's just the list that's relevant for me, but I I always recommend that people do it. I keep this outline and I keep the filled in one as documents on my computer so that if I wake up at three in the morning and think of something I forgot to put down, it's easy for me to add it. Although I also, I, I write it at the end of the outline, you probably should go over it once a year just to make sure that it's current. If you get a new doctor or a new whatever's relevant for you, you have to remember to change it on this as well. Um, now, I assume that's pretty straightforward, um, the, except that you have to come up with your own ideas of who's important. You might have neighbors that you wanted to put down. You might have, um, I mean, it, the, it, the possibilities are very, are infinite and very personal. In terms of estate documents, um, I list those next, but I want you to, if, if you, the estate documents are the basic documents. Um, and I, I was delighted to see that the library is having a program for people who wanna write their own wills because there are people who do. Um, I worked up this program with the village and gave it a few times. And then I realized that having a program on organizing your documents assumes that you have documents. And what amazes me still is how many people do not have wills or trusts or powers of attorney. 
or if they have them, they wrote them 20 years ago and they're probably not very applicable. So if you, I mean, I will say this again, because I, so in any event, the village and I created a second program we're just trying now which is called Making Life Arrangements. And it's designed to encourage people who don't have wills or haven't updated them to think about the fact that they should do it and the various ways you can get it done. So I'm not doing that today, but I really do strongly recommend if you do not have a will or a trust or whatever that you might need that you should do it. So the will, of course, is the basic documents that says what's going to happen after you die with all of your property. In California, because of the way the laws work, if you want to stay out of probate and you have more than a relatively low amount of money, it has to be in trust. Probate is the process, the court process by which wills are sort of approved, finalized, administered or whatever. And it's a big nuisance. And so it's one of those things you want to avoid if you can. Um, powers of attorney are the documents which authorize someone else to act on your behalf with respect to property and assets. And um, you should you should have them in case you're not able to do it yourself. And sometimes you have them just to make it easier. Someone else can do it. And I don't want to take too long today talking about how you set them up. You can only have one will at a time. You can have more than one power of attorney at a time. You might have one that lets someone manage your bank account or pay your bills and another one that lets someone do something else for you. Um, advanced healthcare directives or healthcare proxies or whatever are the uh, equivalent to a power of attorney, but deals with your physical being. Basically, a will takes effect after you die, and trusts and the uh, and the powers of attorney and healthcare proxies are while you are still alive. Um, but um, these are the basic um, things when I put this section together that I was thinking an executor would want to be able to see. An executor might have copies ahead of time, but if they don't, or for some reason or another don't have a full copy, it's important for them to know that they exist and where your executor or your holder of the power of attorney or whatever um, can find them and what they provide. And then things got added. Uh, those were where I started. And over the course of it, uh, people pointed out that um, it would probably, if you have existing funeral or burial arrangements, uh, those should be available and they should be available. They're gonna be needed right away, right? Some people want to write their own obituary. And if you want it to run in the papers promptly, so, you know, someone should be able to find it. Uh, photographs, uh, where you want it published. Uh, organ registry, which is, I think I have one in my driver's license or something, but, you know, people care about that. Long-term care arrangements. This is presumably before you die, but what what do you have? What insurance might you have for that? Uh, any assisted living agreements? If you're living in a assisted living facility, what are the arrangements for that? Um, and then I put, I was trying to think of a polite way to say this. I called it information and guidance on family dynamics. Um, the truth of the matter is whoever's going to be executor is going to have to deal with the people who are the beneficiaries, frequently family. And it's frequently not all that smooth. It's kind of nice to warn somebody what they're walking into and what the issues may be and what to expect. If you can, you can have this as a conversation with your executor. But if you haven't, but you have some issues to warn them about or alert them to, 
writing. It's not an official document. It's just like a map. Um, and then you get into more detail. Some people write their wills and they they may have a, a very, it, everything goes one place or um, the, uh, the, you know, the, they say, I want the jewelry here. But sometimes there needs to be a process by which your six best friends can pick their favorite bracelet or whatever it is. Um, and I think that's uh, something else that should be kept together and be available to the, uh, to the executor. And then I added, I don't happen to have a dog any longer, but people who have pets uh, care about who's taking care of them and who will be taking care of them. Now, Jonathan, I noticed there are 14 things in the chat. Do you think we should start looking and seeing if there are questions we can answer? I mean, I'm not very good. I warn everybody at technology. So I'm going to try and open the chat and see if I can, if there are questions that shouldn't wait. Okay, let's go back to the top. Waterproof, fireproof container. I don't know about fireproof, except this woman put it in her refrigerator, thinking that would provide the, the fireproof protection to the extent you can. I mean, if there's a big fire, I'm sorry to say, almost nothing's going to come out all that well. Um, death and dying. Jonathan, you can answer that. But as I said, there's a program coming up in July, and I think I've seen a bunch of other things. Uh, yeah, the, the, one of our participants um, put a link in, or um, let's see, maybe not, I thought I saw that. I, I will add, yeah, there's the, the Death Cafe um, actually happening on Saturday. Um, there's a link to that in the chat. And, and, and as Georgia noted, the village, the SF village has several programs in this area. I mean, one of them is what I'm doing now, but they have a lot of talking about various issues dealing with that. Um, and then making a living trust and the attorney retired. Um, well, if the lawyer was just the person who wrote it, you may want it updated. If the lawyer was going to be the trustee, you need a new trustee. And I don't, I mean, I think you need uh, to go back and whoever is your new lawyer, if you have one, and just, I don't know how long ago this happened. So that's sort of a generic, I, I don't want to take everybody's time with that. But as things change, and the trick is as they change to make sure your documents change with the changes. I mean, I talked with one woman who had a niece as her executor and came to feel that she wasn't comfortable with her and had to rewrite her will to switch executors. Of course, I then said to her, did you tell the niece you've taken this job away from that she was no longer your executor? And that hadn't occurred to her, but or maybe she didn't want to. Um, Online business reputable and secure for uploading these documents as being able to share specific ones with some people use Google Docs. I like other, I, I can't, you're getting beyond my technical skills on that one. Um, but uh, so I won't even try to answer it. I'm dead now what? Um, it's a book. Um, It's a book put out by the uh, AARP, I believe. And it is a bound book into which you can write a lot of information. It's very good because it gets people to do it. The drawback is it's hard to change. It's like writing in a notebook. I mean, the advantage to doing stuff like this on the computer is you can make changes easily. Uh, but anything that gets people to start in this process, I think, is a good book. So 
Um, I actually ordered it too, and then I decided it was too kind of fixed in the way I could add and subtract. I mean, I'd rather, if you're doing it and you don't want it on the computer, do it in a loose leaf notebook or something or a file or whatever. Uh, but that's my preference. Um, Death Cafe, yes, we talked about that. Put together a notebook, but I have a huge fear of including this in all one spot and count numbers. Is including the last four digits. I'm mostly worried about security. Um, I'm not going to promise everything that's going to happen. I already told you that I don't put account numbers on the computer because that worries me. And then the question is, where do you put it and who has access? One advantage to having it on the computer, let's leave out the account numbers, is that if something happens to where your computer is, you can always get it out of the cloud or wherever that stuff is kept. Um, and I think it is helpful, if you can, to have another place where the information is uh, kept as a backup. I mean, I have it because it's on the computer and my daughter has access to my computer. That means she can go in and get it if something happened in my apartment or to my computer. Um, but um, yes, you have to be careful. And as I said, I don't put account numbers, but I have told people where my bank statements are and no one else can get into my apartment. So that's my comfort level. Um, what else? Another form you want to consider, end of life. I'm not, there are lots of, I mean, I'm not going to go into the specifics about how you write your will or what documents you do. There are experts who do that. I mean, the library is having a will thing, but uh, there are all kinds of documents. The thing I haven't mentioned um, that some people use as a resource for helping structure their estates is uh, licensed fiduciaries. California has the concept, it has a licensed fiduciary. Other states do not. I think it's wonderful to have someone who is in the business of providing fiduciary services and is not also a lawyer or also a banker or also something else. I think they are very focused on what they do. The ones I've talked to care a lot about what they do and it's all they do. So they get quite good at it. Um, for people who are members of the village, the village keeps a list of both estate lawyers and licensed fiduciaries that other members of the village have used with satisfaction. It's not, they're not promising, but it's sort of a resource for village members. And there is a licensed fiduciary website and there's a bar association as sources for lawyers. Uh, but I, it's, I'm not an, I am a lawyer, retired, but I was not an estate lawyer. So this is just somebody who likes being organized, who's gone through the process talking, not an expert. Um, so I think four new messages, more uh, types of people to consider for executors. Um, somebody said something to me, which I thought was absolutely true, which is the most important thing is to pick someone you trust. And after that, it's all detail. Some And it turns on dynamics. Uh, some people have family members. Some people who are who have members of the family who could don't want to because of family dynamics and use a licensed fiduciary. Some people use their lawyer. Um, it's a very individual and personal uh, decision. If you hire a professional, you will pay for the professional and they will charge by the hour uh, for the work they do, which is not unreasonable. If you're doing work, you should get paid for it. If it's a good friend, you're 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 fighting for the bounty of. I am. Is that someone talking to me? 
to get it, everything spread out before you become vultures. Sorry, um, yes, can everyone, this. can you make sure you're muted? I better not even. Okay, just uh, that's a good reminder to everyone. Um, unless you're you're asking a question or speaking, just make sure you're you're muted um, to limit disruptions. Um, Thank you. And um, the uh, the 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 importance is that someone is someone you trust. And the term fiduciary means a person of trust. And so one of the problems with people who get paid is that they get paid. So you've got to make sure it's someone who's going to do the work, but not just try and run up the bills. It's a complicated process. I do strongly recommend before you pick, if you're hiring a professional, that you interview two or three people that you get advice from friends, that you talk to other people. And what I have learned is what one person likes, another person doesn't. It's not that one or the other is wrong, but you want the interaction to work for you and you want to feel comfortable about it. Um, Maria asked about transfer of death and payable on death regarding bank and investment accounts. This is a this is one of the ways that money can be transferred. However, and it will work to transfer. It does not work to keep it out of probate. In New York, just a piece of information you really don't need, if you have a payable on death on your bank account, it automatically is not included in your probate estate. In California, once you're above a certain dollar amount, it has to be in a trust. That I know from myself. I'm not giving that as a legal opinion. I keep saying this, I'm not a licensed California estate lawyer, but they are things to think about with part of thinking about how you're going to and what you wanna do with, how you're gonna transfer your assets and what you wanna do about it. So talk about that with your lawyer or licensed fiduciary or whatever. Um, and um, there you go. Won't, someone, Catherine wrote a whole bunch about this. I'm not gonna go into it. We're really supposed to be talking about the documents assuming they already exist. So maybe what we should do uh, is add to my list. Well, I don't know what I'm supposed to add to my list. Um, where the keys to things are. Yes, I actually have it on my list. We just haven't had a chance to get there. So why don't we go back, Jonathan, and let's talk about um, property to be dealt with. Let's just pick up for, let me see if I can get out of the chat. Oh, yes, I did it. Um, this is obviously only relevant. It sounds like it's only relevant for the uh, executor, but that's because of the way I had the heading. Maybe I should change that. If someone, if you get to the point where someone is helping you or managing for you your property and you are still alive, this information is also essential. In other words, Basically, what is your property? What, what is the things that need both to be dealt with while you're alive and passed on after you have died? And there should be some place where uh, that information is brought together, not necessarily the dollar amounts. I mean, you could say, I have a bank account at, um, well, you can't anymore, but say First Republic. And you don't have to say how much money's in it, but it means somebody knows there's a bank account there. I recommend when people, for people who have not yet done their estate planning, that they start with a list of their assets. Make a list and know what it is you're dealing with and have thought about, because that helps you think about then what you want to do with it. So you have bank accounts, you may have 
deposit boxes. You're not for long because they're not having them as much. But real estate, do you do you own any real estate? Do you own your apartment? Um, if you have a lease, what lease do you have? If someone is uh, going to be paying your bills, what are your monthly rental or HOA fees or whatever? Um, what personal property? Personal property is all the stuff that you have in your uh, life. Uh, and it can be you know, things that matter to you can be valuable or not valuable. Your photo albums may be very important to you or to your foul. You know, what are the things that matter to you? I kept this section short because it's so individual. In other words, I don't even pretend that this is a complete list. And I've had some very interesting conversations with people that has reinforced that. A woman who uh, was an artist has paintings. Of somebody who collects ceramics has ceramics. Somebody who, I mean, nobody, I maybe people here collect racing cars, whatever it is that is your property, someone's going to have to deal with. And it's both important for you to think how you want it dealt with and also for whoever has to do the dealing to know what's there. So um, I listed uh, automobiles, obviously. Um, pets, I don't really think of as property, but there's something that has to be thought of and any other obligations. Um, and uh, it's sort of the working base on which a lot of the other papers are put and the um, the, the executor will have to pay attention. Some of the reasons that it's important, I'll give you examples of why it's important for both before and after. Um, we've talked about powers of attorney. And for starters, you should have a general power of attorney that authorized if Jonathan was going to take care of my money, if I couldn't do it, I would make Jonathan the authorized person under a general power of attorney and say he can do anything so that no matter what needed to be done, he'd have the power. And it survives my becoming incompetent. And it's you know, good for, it can't be used for health, but it can be used for just about everything else. However, there are some places where if you walk in with a general power of attorney, they then get all upset that they haven't reviewed it and they're going to have to look at it and have their lawyer look at it to make sure it's okay. So I recommend, for example, that at your bank, if you want someone to be able to go into your bank and act on your behalf before the will is, before you die, this is while you're alive, because powers of attorney and healthcare proxies are only valid as long as you're alive. Once you die, everything's covered by the will. The trust, the will then usually refers to the trust, but my point is power of attorney is for before you die, but you might you can have more than one power of attorney. So I've made Jonathan in a general power of attorney that authorizes him to do everything in the world. But I also go to my bank and I say, I would like your form because every bank has their own form that their lawyers have approved. I would like your form of power of attorney so that I can authorize Jonathan to operate my bank account at your bank and that you won't give him a hard time when he walks in the door and tries to do it. And frequently you leave it on file at the bank so the bank has it. And that's the kind of planning for uh, dealing with property you have to think about. Oh, there are two bank accounts. I need to go to two banks. And so you start with the list and then you realize that there are further things that need to be done. Um, and uh, it also, I think, one of the challenges, if you haven't done a will, is that the things that need to be done are so overwhelming that people just give up. 
And one of the things that's easy for everybody to do is take a while and write down all your key assets. And then that helps you move on to the other steps as well. Um, and uh, obviously, if you have automobiles, you have to make sure you have automobile insurance and tell somebody where the certificate of title is located or whatever else uh, is relevant information. Um, and then you will notice that we have a heading um, that is where to find things. At one of the early sessions that I did, one of the women, and it was online, said, oh, yes. She said, tell people, A, tell them you've made them the executor. Tell them where the will is. Tell them where everything is. My good friend, I agreed to be the executor. And I had to spend two days going through every piece of paper in her apartment because I didn't know where she put things. And it is, um, for the person who said keys, number N is keys, but it's all the things that someone's going to want to know how to find. I've worked with one woman who would proudly told me the way she had created and filed and boxed and sorted and put in her apartment. And she said, and my licensed fiduciary is going to be my executor. And she knows I have all these things. And I said, did you tell her where to find them in your apartment? Oh, no, I didn't think about it. Hmm, hmm. Well, it's not necessarily obvious. So uh, I believe you should write most of this, all of it down. Some of it you may not wish to tell people where in the refrigerator you hung, your, you know, hid your best jewelry or something. But somebody should know where to find things. Where are the originals? Where are the copies? Some of them. You may have, I mean, I leave my healthcare proxy not only with the people who hold the proxy, but my doctor has a copy. Um, if you use Kaiser, Kaiser has their own form of healthcare proxy and they have it on file. So there are there are places that it makes sense not only to have the information, but to tell people where to find them. Um, and I, I listed all the ones that I wanted to give information on. The other side benefit of, of doing, the, um, doing this project is in the course when I first did it and I was trying to find everything, it caused me to go through some of my files. And I discovered, for example, in my insurance file that I had seven out-of-date insurance policies, and only one that mattered anymore. So it was sort of a housekeeping process as well as um, just making sure I was listing the right one. Um, some, you don't necessarily keep them all in the same place. I have in my apartment, because I use them all the time, for example, my bank statements, my tax out-of-date tax statements are down in a storage room in the garage because... I don't have that much space. I don't need to fill it up, but I have to tell somebody where they can find them if it turns out they need them. So the, the hard one, I mean, I have for me, um, I don't know how everybody else manages information, but there's too much information these days, too many names, too many passwords, too many, what have you. So I have a list of, um, resources, I call them, and it's the list, and it's on my computer, so I can tell somebody where to find it on my computer as well as in a hard file. Passwords, I mean, I finally divided mine in sensitive and not sensitive. If someone finds out my password at the gap, I don't think I really care about it, so that can be on a computer file or a paper copy. Um, Service providers, utilities, that's where you're getting into both before and after you dial, because the chances are, uh, if you own your house or your apartment, you're not going to want the power going off because the bill wasn't paid while you're trying to figure out, the executor's trying to figure out what to do. So these are things that you think about. Um, and.
And I think that thinking about them helps you organize them and so on. Um, I put down photo albums, photographs, memorabilia, uh, because I have to think about what to do with them. But I want someone to know where they are. I may actually try and use one of those services that digitizes everything, but I haven't done it yet. So uh, they're all my lists of things. List of medications. This is one you should have and should update because if someone doesn't know and they are responsible for taking care of you, they should know what your medications are to say nothing, obviously, of the pharmacy where they could get refills and so on. Now, let me go look, uh, chat. Uh, how do I do this? Uh, trans TOD is transfer on death. Pay POD is payable on death. Um, there is no dollar threshold for a trust. The question is, the dollar threshold is when you need it in order to stay out of probate. If you wanted to set up a trust for $10 and spend $1,000 with a lawyer to get one written, you can do it legally. There's just no point to it. Uh, and there are, I don't want to, I mean, someone other than I should explain it. There are trusts that are used just to keep money out of probate. There are trusts that are new, used for very special friends. I have a friend who has a child who is what we call a special needs trust for child, and he cannot manage on his own. And she's taken almost all her money, put it in a trust for this child so that there will be money to take care of him after she dies. So the trusts serve a variety of functions. Um, the legal Zoom off. There are all kinds of online things that offer no low. I I will say that I've worked with when I first started working with encouraging people to do their um do their own wills. And Jonathan, you'll like this. One of the people had the very good sense. She went to the library and there are a couple of very good introductory books. I bet they're at every library in the city. Uh, there's a no low one and a, some, I mean, I, I have it written down somewhere. There are all kinds of books that are introductions to estate planning and writing wills. There are things online you can write your own. Obviously the library is doing it so. But there are ways to do a little bit of research and get some background on the purpose and not just listening to me for three and a half minutes trying to compress a, you know, a very complicated subject. I highly recommend going to the um, uh, going to the library if you are starting this process and getting one of the introductory books um, that they have, and they're very good. Uh, Georgia, my the thing about keys is on the list. Um, so I get credit for that, right? I added that. Um, what age would you recommend have a person has a will? Um, frankly, I think every adult should have a will. Um, it becomes more acute, uh, obviously acute the older we get, but as they say, shit happens. And um, there is no reason why you can't have a very simple will uh, starting as soon as you have your, I mean, no one's going to do it in their 20s. I don't know anybody in their 20s with a will. But 30s, 40s, 50s, what I find astonishing is the people who have a lot of assets, they have people they care about, um, they're not young and they don't have a will. And I sat next to a guy one night and I was working on the program. So I was going around startling people by saying, and do you have a will? And so I said to him, do you have a will? And he said, no, this is a man in his sixties with, was in a, a businessman. He had a wife, I think some relatives or whatever. And I said, oh, I said, why don't you have a will? And he said, well, 
it's difficult and I'd rather watch a football game. Well, how grown up is that? Um, so my answer is, yes, you should have one at almost at any point when you have enough assets. It's a way of taking control of what happens if you something dreadful happens. It's not that hard. And then what you need to do is update it because things change over time. But you don't have to update it. I will tell you that my husband and I updated our wills every five years. And we had just done it. And he basically dropped dead three months later. And we thought it was decades away. So it's not, if you are an adult, it's never too young, but practically people won't do it early. But um, I was just at a reunion and this outline came up and I asked a room of my peers, literally my peers, how many of you don't have wills? Half a dozen people raise their hands. So and I won't tell you how many decades this was, but it was a lot. Um, and I think that um, it's a it's it's an avoidance. It's not that hard to do, and it really means makes a difference. And Georgia, I agree, taking pictures can be very helpful, particularly if the executor is not familiar with your stuff. Or, for example, um, if you have a particular group of assets and you want to make clear who gets what or what goes, if you have something you want to, live to leave to a library, museum, or what have you. Pictures is nice. Pictures is also helpful for insurance, but that's an insurance conversation, not a well, if for people who insure their possessions. I have pictures because I like to look at my friends and family, but that's not useful for this uh, purpose. Um, note to self, power of attorney is only for before death. Yes, power of attorney expires on your death. It used to be that a power of attorney expired if you got dementia or became incompetent. But the way it's now written in some states, you simply say it survives my incompetence in the power of attorney and then it goes until your death. But nothing will make it last after your death. Once you have died, it's the will that takes over in terms of disposing of your assets. Uh, and yes, you do need a will as well as a trust. If you are um, for dealing, you don't need a will if you have a trust that operates while you're alive, but you do have to have the will to dispose of the assets in the trust or to say how it will continue to operate or how you want it. It will spell that out in the will. Um, so yes, you need both. Uh, would bank would would this be for someone who don't want to be a signer on the account exactly? Uh, even if you don't want them to be a they, I mean, you can make them a signer on the account. Um, I I'm not going to give you advice on that. I know people who have added signers. You've got to make sure that if you add them as a signer, it doesn't make them a beneficiary if that's not what you intend. So I'm just saying, do it carefully. If you have just the power of attorney, they can use it before you're incompetent. Um, and then I have a couple of people who are effectively signers at, I have two bank accounts. I am a great believer in having two banks so that if something happens to one, you have another you can use. It's not, you have to leave a lot of money in them. Um, but I have my children down as POA, power of attorney, on each of those accounts, which means the bank knows they can come in and act for me while I'm alive. Uh, we don't have to walk in all the time uh, to remind the bank that you're holding a power of attorney. Um, and, uh, but you can also do it by adding signers. I mean, that's a, everybody has their own way of doing it and lawyers have their own advice and I don't wanna interfere with that discussion. Make sure the computer has backup cloud or device. Yes, 
Um, I don't know. I guess that's a document discussion. I am sufficiently uninformed about backup that I wouldn't give any specific advice. But yes, there should be backup, both to the computer itself and to the information. Um, and uh, I pay Apple a dollar a month or Google or somebody. So I have some cloud. But it, that comment tells you how little I understand about it, except I know I have it. Um, and yes, they, they, I have not tried to sort through the information list by which document they relate to or documents. What I was trying to do was share, I had, I had created the documents by the time I did the outline, but it is, the idea of it is critical information. And I think of the power of attorney, the healthcare, the will, the trust, as a bundle of documents that relate to your estate and perhaps the end of your life. And so I was trying to think globally across all those documents. They don't all relate to um, all the documents. I will give you a guess, but you can't hold me to it. I believe the threshold for keeping out of probate is now $160,000 in California. I'm not giving you that as a legal answer. You can look it up on Google, frankly. Uh, you can look an amazing number of things up on Google. Some of them are correct, some of them are not. Um, but that, I think, is it's a ballpark answer. And for people, I can say this, for people who are uh, not um, in a position to spend lots of money on lawyers and so on, you can get wills. If you don't want to write it yourself, you can go to legal aid. And there are a couple of legal aid offices that will write a will for free and a power of attorney and a health care proxy. Um, and if you are under the threshold, as I understand it, and I did research on this because my training was all in New York, probate has a system where you go in and you fill out a simple form and that's the end of it, designed for people who are below whatever the threshold is. Um, but um, I cannot um, promise you that that's the right number because I just looked it up and I'm not a lawyer in California. Um, so let's go on to the last thing, which is section five. Some people put this at the front of their outline. As I said, I mean, I started with the personal information because I am assuming someone's going to have to take care of my body before I have died. I mean, take care of me and we'll need personal information. If you really don't expect that, or you just like the order better, sometimes it's helpful to have right at the front, a list of a sort of a reminder list, both to you and whoever is the executor, as to things that need to be done right away when somebody dies or promptly thereafter to care, you know, to bear in mind. So what, what are some of the things, and this is not the order in which you have to take action, but people, there, there are notices need to be given to places like Social Security, Medicare, uh, healthcare, what have you. Uh, if you have a funeral home, sometimes at New York, it's the only place I've gone through it, uh, they send the notice to uh, Social Security and Medicare. Um, some places don't. But the same thing goes if you have a pension that ends with your lifetime. Why do you want to do it right away? Because if you don't and the money comes into the deceased's account, it has to be sent back. You're, if I have a lifetime pension from one of the places where I worked, I'm only entitled to get it as long as I'm alive. If it gets sent into my bank account, 
my executor would have to send it back. So it's just as easy to stop it from coming in. But that that collection of places should get notices. Um, in no particular order, what is useful to get a, several copies of the death certificate. Why do you want them? This is not for wallpaper. This is because many places you go when you walk in with your um, evidence, for example, if you're the executor, if the executor wants to go in and do something, many different institutions will say, I. I want to see the probate authorization or whatever it is, and I want to see a copy of the death certificate. I mean, um, I needed that for turning off a utility. It was just the most bizarre thing. Why did the electric company need a copy or whatever utility it was? But they wanted a copy of the death certificates. The easiest time to get a death certificate or a bunch of them is right away after somebody dies, and you can order. I mean, I ordered, I don't know, 15 of them, and I used almost all of them. Uh, some places are getting better and will take a copy. But my point is, think of it while it's easy. If you have a funeral home, they will order them for you, usually. Um, then you get to the question of uh, credit cards and so on. And... Um, do you turn them off or not? Um, in theory, once the person who held the credit card has died, um, the credit card should end. But a lot of people have bills getting paid on those credit cards, and you might want them to make the final payments before you have to come up with some other way to make payments, for example, for utilities. I cannot legally advise you to keep the credit cards and just not notify them right away. But there are decisions you might choose to make to let it slip for a month or two. I will tell you, I didn't change the utilities for months. It was just too complicated. And since I'd been paying them anyway, the fact that they were in my husband's name wasn't worth the uh, I had enough else to deal with. I just didn't want to do it. So there are those kinds of considerations. There are some things that you have to decide that whether or not you want to continue them. For example, you might definitely want to keep the heat on and the electricity on and whatever in whatever place you are living, particularly if you own it. You may not care if there's a landline there anymore. So there are thoughts that have to be given to that. Um, internet services, I would guess, could be turned off, but I don't, some of them not. If you want to be able to sit in that house as an executor and use the computer, you may want to keep using the computer and not turn that off. And all the documents that were on my husband's computer, when it got turned off, I didn't have access to. So there are, well, I had trouble having access anyway, but I mean, my point is you have to make, uh, you have to pay attention is what this list really is, is think about it and pay attention. Insurance premiums. Um, if the person who died owns real estate, you have to make sure the real estate continues to be insured until it's sold or transferred. And one of the women who showed up actually at the library session said, oh, I remember I had a friend or a niece or somebody who inherited uh, a house in Oakland and didn't remember to keep the insurance on it. And there was a terrible fire and she lost the house and had no insurance. So it's that kind of thing. And, um, uh, those are all things that require attention and probably sooner rather than later. Then there are things I know nothing about. I know nothing about social media, so I have no opinions really on whether you keep it going or not. Someone suggested to me that 
if someone had, and I don't remember what kind of an account it was, LinkedIn or something, you might want to post a notice on it about somebody's death. Beyond my technical competence, but they are things that people who are in this area feel strongly about one way or the other, and so you should pay attention to. Um, and then I just mentioned again, the automatic bill payments. Um, if, if you can manage to keep them going, um, it may be an easy way as an executor, for example, to continue to pay, um, uh, to pay utilities or what have you. You may not want to pay credit cards. You may want to stop a credit card once it's been paid for the last month the person was alive because you know, there's enough credit card fraud. You don't necessarily want credit cards hanging out there for someone to abuse. I, I believe the credit card companies now have a very good <clears throat> fraud alert system, but they exercise it by calling you and saying, did you just buy 100 gallons of gas in New Jersey? which was a call I literally got once when my credit card number had been taken. Since I was in California at the time, the answer was no. But if there's no one to answer that phone call, there may be more of a risk with credit cards. So these are the ones that I thought of. I suspect, oh gosh, we have eight more. Uh, voter roll, DMV, jury duty. Oh, those are great ideas. Maybe I'll add that. Um, the uh, California probate threshold 2012. Okay, people are providing links. The amount is 184. I'm so glad I didn't give you a firm number. Um, quick and legal Clifford Will book. Yes. And there, there's a NOLO book on writing, N-O-L-O, -O, has a good series of introductory things. And there's a NOLO book generally, not on writing a will, but sort of what is the function of a will and a trust and how does it work? And I think those are good books to take. And the library has them. Um, and, um, oh, NOLO, someone wrote it down. There you go. Okay. Regular payments, yes, yes. That's sort of what I've been talking about. Um, to deal with assets held by married couple when one spouse dies. Ask your lawyer. It's my answer to, I know California is a um, common law state but I lived in a non-common law state, so I do not know. And my husband died in New York, so I have never had a husband in California. I don't know if you need a trust. I don't think so. I think the trust, well, let me step back. A trust can be A for probate, and B, it can be a way of managing or controlling assets. And that is a lawyer question. I mean, the real question is, what do you want to do? And then the question is, do you need a trust to do it? And so your goal may be, I want to stay out of probate. Okay, there are a bunch of answers. I want to make sure that the money goes in this particular way. A trust may be a way to do it. But I would start not with talking about, do I need a document to do X? I would start with talking about what you want to do and then find the right document to do it. And that goes across all the documents we've been talking about. Um, and I love the idea of a list if you are uh, really organized and that's where you can put it all together uh, for all your monthly payments. Uh, that's, that is very helpful. And I may go back and provide, I, I think I provided that for my kids, but everybody does it in different ways. Now, I guess what I'm going to ask is whether anybody has any other questions that they would like to ask. I hope everybody saw that this outline is available. You've gotten it. 
I have no restriction on it. If you have anybody who wants a copy of this outline, give it to them. Tell them about the YouTube that Jonathan just made if they want to watch it. Um, but um, my I do this because I think it's helpful. It was something I found useful and my friends have found it helpful. So um, as far as I'm concerned, the more people who get it to work off of, the better. So I, you can do what you want with it. Uh, any other questions, Jonathan? Is there anything else I should say, do? Um, let's see. So I, some folks have asked in the chat um, how to get a copy of this outline. Um, I've posted a link. Um, it's a Google Doc um, that you can access. Um, and download, print, um, however you like to uh, consume it. Um, it's the the link I just posted there. It's a bit.ly link, critical documents outline. Um, so yeah, if anyone came in late and didn't see that link earlier, it's in the chat there. And also um, feel free to email our department afterwards if you're having uh, trouble remembering where that was. Um, I'll put our email in the chat right now. Um, it looks like... Yeah, there was one other question, which I will add an opinion, which I don't want to be taken as more than a very personal opinion. When my mother was older and I was paying all of our bills and all of her bills, I went to auto pay for all the utilities simply because it was overwhelming to do it any other way. And um, it did mean that I didn't have to every month pay her utilities and my utilities and some of my kids' utilities. Um, I love, I am less worried about a utility committing a fraud on an auto pay than other places I might work. But that's my personal opinion. And it does, uh, it may stop depending on how you arrange it when the person dies, but at least for as long as they're alive, it means they get paid. And I do know, for example, that there is a city department that will help people uh, who are unable to pay for someone else to help them if they have nobody else to do it. And they put people on auto pay for all the bills they can come up with as a way of making sure that things don't go unpaid because people either didn't get around to them or didn't remember to do them or thought they'd done them or whatever. Um, so I personally put those on auto pay. Um, and then there's some you can put on auto pay, but might still want to check. I mean, I have my credit card bills on auto pay, but I check them because uh, I get a printed statement because I like printed statements. So I do both, but at least I don't worry about their being paid. Um, it, it's what you put on auto pay. Um, and some places insist that some things my uh, my, they didn't really insist, but my homeowners association, we're all on auto pay because the port, I mean, one of us is doing the bank account and he doesn't want to have to go to the bank every month with everybody's check. So I think auto pay that is automatic is wonderful, but that's my particular preference. Uh, voter roll, DMV, jury duty, hard copy subscriptions. Those are all new ideas. Uh, I may add See, I told you every time I do this, I add to it. Order roll. DMV. Well, DMV, you have to deal with things like turning your license, the license back in and the stuff like that. But I think that's all good. So this session has also added to the outline uh, for the next class. 15 new messages. Oh, my goodness. There's a lot of thank yous in there. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. The, the outline should have gone to everybody who had signed up for this. Um, and I hope you have found it helpful. I... I I like the fact of 
of being helpful. And this is one of those things that people can do without too much stress. Um, and I think it's, it's worth doing. Uh, and yes, I believe the write your own will is in person only. That's correct. It's going to be at the main library. Um, it's it's the kind of thing that we can't really offer remotely um, because the actual will writing process um, there's there there's uh, things that can't be done virtually. But um, there will part of that uh, presentation is on estate planning, and we do have virtual programs um, on estate planning and avoiding probate. So um, you know, keep an uh, keep a an eye on our events calendar, uh, subscribe to our department newsletter if you're interested in those things, um, because we, we try to offer those uh, several times a year. Okay, well, everybody, I'm delighted you all came. I'm glad to talk with you all um, and have a good, have, enjoy the sun while it we have it in San Francisco. It's rare and wonderful. And thank you, Jonathan, for organizing. This was Thank you, Susan. Yeah, this was great. I, I learned a whole lot here. There's so many things on this outline that I had never thought of before. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, of course. So <laughs> I, I suspect that a lot of uh, our participants had a similar experience. And so, yeah, I want to again, thank you so much. This was great. Okay. Um, Everybody, have good luck. And uh, I'm sure you'll make great progress on this. And everyone, um, keep an eye out um, later today. I will be sending out a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this program. I will include a copy of the outline as well. And there's going to be a very brief survey included. Uh, please take a moment to fill that out. We um, we use those to design future programming, um, improve on uh, what we're currently offering. So it only takes a minute and it really helps us out. Um, so keep an eye out for that. And I think that's all for me. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Susan.